everyone. So I think we're just about ready to get started. We got a, peop a few people just rolling in, but uh, I'm just here to say hi and welcome to part two of our Pathway series. So uh, some of you all heard uh, on Tuesday from Delaney Harris and Katie Brown uh, a little bit about Pathways and they were uh, talking to young folks who are currently in college. Today, I'm super excited to introduce y'all to Alex Lang and to Monica Ellis. Uh, so we're going to hear a little bit more from them about their pathways in music. Um, all of your cameras are off. That's just a, a little bit of a warning, fair warning to you all. However, if you want to interact with our guests, please feel free to use either the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen or the chat feature. Uh, my colleague Emily Bourne, who's currently on the screen, uh, is going to be monitoring that, as well as my colleague Diana Melgar, who's off screen, but as always, uh, ever present. Uh, so with all of that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Alex and Monica, take it away. Well, good morning. Um, my name is Alex Lang, and I'm really excited today to be hosting this conversation with uh, my good friend and colleague and fellow traveler for many years, Monica Ellis. So uh, a little about Monica. Monica Ellis is a founding member of the Grammy-nominated Win Quintet, Imani Wins who in their 23rd season continued to make groundbreaking art while maintaining a vigorous international touring schedule. And um, as the administrative director and tour manager for Monty Wins and co-artistic director for the Imani Wins Chamber Music Festival, she maintains a fulfill fulfilling leadership role within the group. So um, let me just uh, sort of lay out what we're gonna do here today. We're gonna talk about pathways, uh, the pathway that Monica has followed both from sort of beginning as a music student off to college and then founding Imani and now off into the future and the present of what that means. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Monica. If you could just sort of tell us a little bit about your origin story and uh, this first pathway from beginning your instrumental instruction uh, through, uh, I guess, the founding of Imani Wins. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you, Alex. Thank you, all the folks out there in LA. We, I'm uh, very, very honored and happy to be here chatting with, with you all today. I'm in New York City in Harlem, where I've lived for, uh, for most of those 23 years. In fact, all of those years that Alex just talked about. This is my home here. But I grew up in Pittsburgh. And um, when growing up um, in the 80s, basically, ages me a bit, but that that's accurate, um, talks about, shows the, the, the vital um, public school education that I was fortunate enough to have. Uh, as a kid growing up, I called myself a self-proclaimed band kid. I was always from, starting from third grade, um, in some type of music program in this public schools. We had a, a wonderful Saturday program that was a public school free program as well that I took advantage of from middle school all the way through high school, which was really, really instrumental in my entire development as a musician. Uh, but yeah, the early years I started on clarinet. Um, and thankfully for you, Alex, I, I stopped. <laughs> But that was my first instrument. <laughs> um, that, that, and, but I still played it in middle school, and um, even though that was my first instrument, clarinet, saxophone, played quite a bit of piano too, which I'm extremely grateful for, um, even to this day, just for theory and, and ear training. I, I see a keyboard in my head oftentimes mm -hmm. when I'm thinking about music. Um, and my clarinet teacher also was a bassoon player. And so I was able to get some really early instruction when my middle school band teacher um, introduced me to the bassoon. He said, why don't you give this a shot? And that, speaking of pathways, was, was, the, first, was the first one. I mean, amazing teachers have always been in my life. And so I'm grateful for, for that too. Uh, so that middle school band teacher, he said, give this a try. You've been doing these other instruments. Let's try something different. My, uh, private clarinet teachers helped me along on the bassoon in those, in those early months, weeks. And, um, eventually though, after about a year, he felt like I had 
advanced enough that another teacher would benefit me better. And, um, you know, I, I, again, I just think when I think about these, these people and the graciousness of, of them, it's, it's really remarkable um, that he saw that he had the foresight to see that, you know, somebody else, not him, would be better for me. And, and that's really a testament to an incredible teacher, if you ask me. So um, in high school, I studied with uh, the um, second bassoonist of the Pittsburgh Symphony at the time. His name was Mark Pantarev. He was an old timer. I would go over to his house, have two hour lessons and, you know, he'd say things to me and I had no idea what he was talking about, but he said them anyway. <laughs> he'd talk about composers that I had not heard of and and, you know, read making, which I had not done any of up at that point. But I just feel like it's kind of like when you t when you talk to your kids that, you know, in a way that is adult or, or not like the baby talk, you know, you really speak to speak. I was spoken to like a more advanced player. But when I look back on it, I love that that happened because it made me think that way, even if I wasn't right um, technically and in, in that position at the time. Um, so yeah, he, he got me, you know, ready for the youth orchestra in Pittsburgh. There was a couple different orchestras, but, um, some summer programs, uh, I went to Chautauqua music festival in high school. Um, he got me ready for that. He got me my, he, he, you know, helped me obtain my, uh, my instrument, which I still play on to this day. Um, the, my only instrument that I've ever had since high school. Um, and so it was through, really through his efforts and, and his guidance that led me to uh, audition for a conservatory and really think that I could do this as a, as a real thing. Um, I went to Oberlin for my undergrad and then uh, graduated there and then went to Juilliard for my master's degree uh, in, in bassoon performance. That's how I got to New York. Um, and, and then met Alex at uh, Manhattan School of Music where I was doing a postgraduate diploma, um, whatever they call those things, and <laughs> <laughs> in an orchestral performance, what's it go? Orchestral performance program, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So the, the irony is that, you know, I was in this program, but I actually did not become an orchestral player at all. Um, and pretty early on, didn't even, I, I took auditions, but just a few. So um, I, I think being in New York, if um, for me, the city offered so many opportunities as a musician, as a freelancer, and I was really interested in that stuff. And, it, and although I did take a few auditions here and there, the, the uh, variety of things that I could do, I think, interested me more. Um, and just the city itself. I mean, I was just kind of excited to be here in this, in this environment. And and the energy that um, that it gave me. So um, Imani wins. We started in 97. So it was the same year that I went to Manhattan School for the postgraduate uh, degree. And um, we met through our founding flutist, Valerie Coleman, who initially had that idea to put together a group made up of musicians of color and it was really her concept to see if our familiar back, if our similar backgrounds would actually inform the music that we would play. Um, eventually, of course, her music, she's an incredible composer, her music, as well as our French horn player's music, Jeff Scott, um, truly defined the sound of Imani Winds and, and continues to do so to this day. Uh, but it was their music and the idea of not just the standard quint quintet repertoire, which you finish that fast, um, realizing that not just those pieces would really um, allow for us to have a much more open mind about what kind of music we could play and what kind of impact we could have. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, that's early years up until 97 and then the, the following 23 years, 24 years is a whole other story, which which I know we'll, we'll kind of touch upon. Yeah, before we get to that, let's let's hang out a little bit in this sort of first. So. Let's again with this with this idea of pathways in mind. Can and I know it was just as long for me, but can you <laughs> talk about or reflect on that application process? Did you only apply to Oberlin? Did you visit many schools? You know, Oberlin is out in the country. You know, uh, did you know that going there? Did you want that? You know, can you just sort of unpack what you you know what, how it sits in your mind now? Obviously, sure. you know, for both of us, it was a while ago. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sure. It, you know, uh, the, the guidance of, of people around me um, helped so, so much. And I know everybody does not always have that opportunity that, you know, in a lot of ways, you're kind of, as a young kid, you're, you might be guiding yourself. You know, now we can do so much research online and you can see the virtual campus and, and, and see what something might be like. But, you know, that wasn't really the case. Um, those 25 20 20 something plus years ago so you really had to at least for me had to go upon what others were telling me was um would would maybe be a good fit so i didn't apply to a lot of schools um uh the a funny story is that i wanted to apply to curtis but they weren't accepting any bassoon players that year so uh, you know my teacher mr pantsereff he was he was not happy about that. He was like, you would be you would be amazing there. And I mean, and to be really, really honest, I don't think I even had a concept of the hierarchy of these institutions. Like I knew that they were great. I knew I wanted to study the bassoon. I was excited about not having to practice the piano anymore. <laughs> I was like, because <laughs> I was playing so much piano, but I was a very good pianist, but not an excellent pianist, which of course at the conservatory level, that's what you have to be. Um, so I was ready to just like take that off my plate. So, you know, I, I could have been anywhere. I was, I was kind of <laughs> excited to be anywhere. Um, and it is out in the sticks, Oberlin, but it was close to Pittsburgh, only a two and a half hour drive door to door. So we're so far, you know, we're not the East Coast. We think we are, but we're Midwest. Um, no, I know. <laughs> you're, uh, right. I know, right? <laughs> we're not, we're just some hicks, you know. No, no, um, no. I'm just saying Western PA is different from Eastern PA. Very much my, so. Yeah. So full disclosure, my brother lives in Pittsburgh and actually yeah. our our older siblings went to college together which right. that might show up at some point in this storytelling but please right, go on right, right. It, it is a part of the story it's I mean just the irony of the small world that we're all in um yeah so you know I I, I applied to Overland Eastman um and uh Indiana actually mm -hmm. and so um Mr. Panzer thought that those would be good choices for me um and and it, it was I think important for me to be close to home just to have a sense of I could get home quickly and easily just just for that security um uh you know just the family environment is really really close-knit and uh and again in retrospect i think it was great to to be able to go home quickly and just and if i needed it um uh but yeah i mean we i had my overland and eastman audition in the same weekend um in a february or weekend some february you know and uh uh i remember my mom and i driving to Eastman, and of course it was cloudy and raining because it's Rochester. That's just what it is all the time. <laughs> and, the, and the audition went well. Yeah, it was okay. It was great. It was great. I, I was accepted to Eastman. Um, and and but we went. You know, we came on down to Ohio the following day for the audition there, and literally like the sun came out. I mean, mm -hmm. it was just it was it was like the Wizard of Oz when it's black and white and then it's color. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> like we're in Oz now. And it was just oh, my mom and I kind of looked at each other. We were like, right, right. I know. <laughs> you know, it was it was really something. Um, you could tell the energy of Oberlin, and I my lesson was was really long. George Sakakini is who I studied with at Oberlin. We connected really well. Um, it was more like a I said lesson. I actually said lesson. My audition felt like a lesson. You know. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a panel of people, so just everything that it um, that that Oberlin showed me um, seemed to be a really good fit for me. And and yeah, to this day, I'm an Obi for life. You know, it's mm -hmm. we're, we're a close knit bunch of bunch mm -hmm. of people. Yeah. <laughs> can you can you talk a little bit a, a little bit about um, was the idea that there the conservatory was you know Oberlin's unique in that there are there are some conservatories that have a relationship with the university cincinnati eastman actually does peabody but they're, they're from my understanding they're not quite as knitted together in the same way that Oberlin college and Oberlin conservatory are, is um, i'm wondering was that something that you thought about at the time yes or no and now looking back how do you think about it as something you're do you think about how would you be different if you had gone to Curtis? Um, and how do you think about that? Right, at all? right. Yeah, you know, um, yes. I mean, uh, you're, you're, the trajectory of your life, uh, if one, one small thing was different, you know, like that scene in Benjamin Benjamin Button, you know, where 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 the where the girl she 
she gets hit by the car and then she can't be a dancer anymore. And like mm. every scene, they go backwards by one small thing that was would would have shifted. Then that wouldn't and that accident wouldn't have happened, you know. So yeah, if 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 something else had occurred, if I had ended up at at Curtis or Eastman, you know, had I gone to, would I have gone to New York for grad school? Who knows? You know, I might have gone to Texas. I might have gone wherever. And then what Imani Winslow started. So like everything is, um, there's there's a way to look at your life and say, well, if I if something had had been different, then everything else, the domino effect would have happened. And and absolutely for sure. Um, as far as Oberlin, the college goes. Yeah, I was never interested in um, in doing like the double degree thing. I had many, many friends who did that and they were always, always tired. Like they always had so much work to do. <laughs> I just, you know, that was not for me at all. I mean, I was, academics were, were really big for me in high school. And so, um, but, but yeah, it truly, it was not my calling at all. And even I remember my mom talking about, and this is really applicable for, for young students in high school, thinking about that college career, that conservatory route. And she said, you know, at least think about music education, music ed, take some music ed classes, you know, the idea of falling back. Like she, I could not have a better, have had, and, and to this day have a better supporter literally my number one fan but even then she's still you know back then and now she's still a mom she wants the best wants to knows that 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 a, a career in music might not be the um easiest route to take so you know she was talking about music education classes and you can always fall back that idea of falling back on being a teacher you know so those conversations were had and and i never took them though you know i didn't mm -hmm. have that that pull um to go the music education route and i know somebody some some folks do even you know our our my colleague our friend uh toyin spelman diaz a oboist of imani wins who was also with us at manhattan school she did a few she was a music ed uh double degree um i'm sorry not double degree but double major music mm -hmm. ed and, and oboe for for a year and um with this same concept and she re she realized that it just wasn't for her um, and her obo teacher said, you know, you really need to make a decision because it's just taking up too much time and you need to, you need to go, you know, you need to study this, this one route of, of being an oboist. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, you gotta just do some soul searching and really know that direction that you want to go in and stay that course. I think, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's of course, so competitive these days and, and difficult to imagine uh, in all honesty, it's it's you know I sometimes say I'm glad I'm I'm not a student because the competitive nature has risen the 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 amount of students out there graduating from conservatories that are so excellent is has risen and it just makes it a tougher market. Um, at the same time, you need to do what you feel is the best course of action for you, you know, and, mm -hmm. and not feel that way of uh, have that sense of falling back on something. Now. Mm -hmm what my life has turned into and the administrative aspects of things and me doing so many other things um, with Imani Wins, uh, especially, I feel like that's still not my profession. You know, I don't, I'm not an administrative director by profession. I'm still a bassoonist, you know. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, there's a lot of different hands to be dealt here. Like you can, you can say, well, you're, you, you have all these admin skills. So was that something that you could have done as well? maybe and it's and as time goes on you're out here in the world you're out here having experiences you get to realize you do have other skill sets that can be mm -hmm. utilized to make for a you know a, a, a comprehensive life and career mm -hmm. but when you're in college you know it's hard enough so focus on what you want to do mm -hmm. and, and have that be your real guiding force mm. that reminds yeah. me of some advice that i heard last night from uh Rachel Roberts, who is director of the music leadership program at Eastman, and this is a similar type of environment. She, she said trust, she talked about the importance of uh, trusting your gut, trust your gut, and yeah. encouraging young people to really believe in, in their own gut, um, as they, especially as they're starting off in these pathways. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit on this pathways. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the pathway of Imani wins, you know? Um, so both sort of, um, you know the, the 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 story how is it founded and and also the your individual pathway through that ensemble you know as a musician but 
you know, your role as the, you know, uh, managing, what's, do you have like an official title? Managing? It's a, yeah, it's managing, administrative, administrative yeah. director and tour manager. Administrative director, yeah. Right. And I sort of think of it like if Monty, if Imani wins were a law firm and you're all partners, there's a role for the managing partner. Right. right. But there's a partner that, that they're, you know, handling a lot of nuts and bolts and making sure the bills get paid and making sure the fees come in and all that sort of stuff. Right. So, yeah, take it away. I'd love to hear. And yeah, tell yeah. the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, right. So 97, 98, that first season, um, Valerie has this great idea. She contacts people. Um, she had known our clarinetist, our former clarinetist now, Miriam Adam. She knew her from a summer festival. They went to Aspen the summer prior. Uh, they both ended up in New York for graduate work. And she calls her first and says, you know, I I've got this idea. Uh, are, you are you down? And she and Miriam said, yeah, yeah, I'd love it. She says, okay, all I need is a, a horn player, a bassoon player, <laughs> and a <lower> player. <laughs> so we got two fits. We got two fits. <laughs> um, and she gets recommendations for Toyin through a, a, another Oboe friend, and Toyin actually recommended me um, from our Oberlin days and then our Manhattan school days. So, um, and then Jeff was yet another recommendation. So it, it was it was in a lot of ways um, just the perfect storm of the five of us really having a chemistry that, that did not, uh, like, it wasn't a snap. If you talk to Valerie, she does feel like, you know, the talk about the sun coming out and like, it really was this magical moment it. Um, but for the rest of us, I think we came on bit by bit um, in our own time. But it was clear early on that we did have something special, that we did have some chemistry that we could cultivate, that we could um, that we could begin to, to think about doing something with. Uh, we didn't think about an all African American and Latino wing quintet being something to this being something that was necessary. That wasn't initially on our minds. We just knew that like what we were doing was really cool for us and let's share it. You know, that was mm -hmm. really it. it. The idea of being, not that you asked this, but that no, uh, yeah, the idea of being a role model or the idea of being, you know, something for this cause wasn't really there. It was just, we feel like we've got something that's really cool and, and we are putting our time and effort into it and let's go ahead and see what can actually occur from it. Um, and, and those early years, we've, we've, we had to come into the roles that were separate from the instruments. We had, we had to kind of come into those roles as time went on. Me being an administrative person, I, I had a lot of experience doing that at Oberlin in my work study. Um, I was, you know, I was in managerial roles and in my work study jobs at, at Oberlin, uh, you know, I was an office assistant at Juilliard for my work study. So like, you know, I wasn't, I, I did have a little bit of, a little bit of experience in that regard. Um, uh, and, and so I kind of saw the need for that with Imani Wins and, and Valerie even to this day would say, yeah, I did some stuff in the beginning that was managerial and I was terrible at it. So Monica, <laughs> Monica came on through and, you know, some things I was like, Mm, I think I can help. I don't really know. I don't know the all the answers, but just the organizational skills that I have alone would help our um, help our situation here. And so, yeah. So, I mean, from from getting a tax ID number to opening up a bank account that was that was to the, for the group. You know, that was something that I did very early on, so that we were not getting paid. An individual's getting paid, and then we have to disperse the the, the fees. Um, and this is even before management, before before you know we got to another level. Just the initial uh, uh, gigs here and there, you know, little gigs here and there. Um, yeah, we we took some we took some competitions early on that uh, allowed we won some, we lost some, but the the goal towards the preparation, you know, towards going to those competitions was really really vital for us. Um, you know, we just wanted to practice. We just wanted to like just be around each other and just be in the shed as much as possible. Like that was really what excited us. Um, we had the luxury of time back then in those early years because no families yet, no huge responsibilities job-wise. Um, so we would rehearse five hours a day, you know, 
I don't know, four, three or four times a week. Um, in where fact, our first... Pra- yeah, where did you get rehearsal space? Just cur- just to practically speaking. Um, schools, schools, because mm-hmm. st- we still mm-hmm. had some affiliation with mm-hmm. uh, Manus. Well, yeah, Valerie had graduated from Manus. I was actually doing some some ringer work at Manus, believe it or not. Mm. So um, with like filling in, filling in when they didn't have uh, bassoon players for certain ensembles and stuff. Um, Manhattan School, Valerie was still at, uh, Marion was still at Manhattan School. So we, yeah, we used the, uh, used our, our resources of our, where we had gone to just be like, mm-hmm. Hey, can we, you know, sign out of room real quick? I was mm-hmm. friends with the security guards at Juilliard and they would be mm-hmm. like, come on, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, like my mom said, and my sister actually, Tiffany said, you know, make friends with, with the cafeteria workers and the security guards, you know, cause they're the ones that's going to take care of you in school. That, those mm-hmm. are the ones that, we can end the session right here. That's good. Thanks That's for right. joining us, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. That's all you need to know. How to be successful in college, yeah. find the security guards and the cafeteria work. Yep. That's it. That's it. Yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, you know, early on, we, 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 I was going to say we, um, we were going to name our first CD 10 to 1, 2 to 5. Like that was our schedule. We would do <laughs> six, well, 10 to 1. Take an hour break, two to five. So actually six mm. hours of rehearsal. Mm. Eventually that became a little unsustainable. You know, we were getting diminishing returns of with a schedule like that. But for many, many years, we we had that kind of rigor um, mm. just to just to be in it together um, so that when we did, you know, get out on the stage and get into these competitions, we would have we would have stuff figured out. So, yeah. At what point? So, um Obviously, so from the beginning, Imani thought of itself as be, as being or becoming a professional group. Is that a, is that a true statement? Yes, yes, I would yeah. say so. Yes. Yes. Um, so you weren't just like a, a a student ensemble that transitioned to, but rather you 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 came together with the idea of we're gonna we're gonna be a professional group that gets fees to perform. Is that right. a fair? Is that that is fair. Fair. However, um, we had to all still come to what it took to do that. And so the notion of that is, you know, you say that it's like, okay, that makes sense. And, and this is what we were, but everybody sort of had a different idea of, of what kind of work needed to happen to be professional. Mm. And I would say about two or two, maybe the third year in, um, yeah, like the second, two and a half years, three years in, we we had to have a sit down with each other. We said, look, you know, we're doing some stuff. We had put on our own little concert series. Um, so we had goals to to go towards. We were looking at um, competitions, co- chamber music competitions. Fish Off is one of them. The Coleman competition is one for early um, uh, emerging groups. Um, but we said, we are just not putting in enough time. We're just not. And so let's let's say we're going to do, a, you know, a whole lot more and, and create schedules and create goals or let's let's end it now. And, you know, we'll go have some lunch every now and then. Like and we could be friends. You know what I mean? It was, a, it was very similar to relationship talk. You know, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. What are we doing? You know, so. <laughs> Right. You know, let's 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 keep this going and right. put in work or like, you know, no hard feelings. I see you when I see you. So mm-hmm. we li- we had to absolutely I call it the come to Jesus meeting. Like we had mm-hmm. we had to have that very serious conversation. And for that matter, we had that conversation even a few more times. The stakes were higher later on. We were talking about bigger goals. We were talking about different projects that we needed to do and the work that needed to be put in it put in for that but you know you got to like check in again relationships you got to check in with one another and and talk about what's not happening and talk about you know what more do we need to do things like that so yeah yeah it was um it it we 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 thought about it as a professional thing but then had to re up the commitment Mm -hmm at a point in order to manifest that, that, uh, mm. that original notion. That's great. So if just, um, so I have two questions, uh, and I'll, I'll lay them both out there and we can take them one at a time. One is I'd love to talk a little bit more about how. So how do you function as the administrative leader of Amani Wins? Where did those skills come from? You talked about some work study jobs, but like how, and what's what does that actually look like? That's one question. The other question is just, 
like I'd love to hear this the what was the the first professional the first concert that Imani gave did you did you do that for free were you paid from the beginning how did that how did that happen um yeah yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, the, the admin how, administrative how, you know, um, thankfully nowadays there really are in schools and in, in, in uh, conservatories, there really are these classes and even degree programs that you can have in administra in, in entrepreneurship um, that, you know, have courses that talk about administration and talk about the business of music and you know that wasn't that wasn't around when we were in school you know the, and to mm. the degree at least that it is now mm -hmm. um and so so yeah it was a lot of, it was a bit of trial and trial and error it was a bit of just you know asking questions seeing what is right looking at what other groups might be doing that were similar to ours business models you know even these terms i didn't know like a lot uh, of of kids may know in, in you know when you're 25 26 like yeah this wasn't just at the ready I just knew like okay I can put together a spreadsheet which also wasn't even a term ish you know what I mean like something's <laughs> so changed in the last 20 years but um, you know I could develop I could I could organize and mm -hmm. um, that there was there I did and do have that skill of organizing and and um, getting collective schedules thoughts and here's you know here's the plan um uh so yeah so it's i think recognizing what those skill what your skill sets are and i was going to say that the roles that we came into eventually um embrace those roles like if you're in an ensemble and you're trying to figure out how to you know your very question how to function see talk about the skill sets that you actually have uh, with your fellow bandmates, or even if you're doing something on your own, really think about that. Write this stuff down. You know, be be active about. Um, and it doesn't have to be some PowerPoint spreadsheet. You know, presentation. It can it can be very simple, so or simplistic, but um, still thorough enough so that you know what you what your skills are to try to execute the the job. Um, so um, yeah, so you know, I, I started to just learn how to. We talk to talk to managers about um, what we, well, you know, like a gig would be offered to us. This is when we did finally get management. What does that gig entail? What are we? We had to figure out like how much we wanted to. We had to quantify uh, our performances. So there's the recital itself, but we were doing a lot of outreach as well. So you know, what is that number to us? Um, what do we think is fair? How much does it cost to get there? Because that's usually not um, included. Um, uh, look at what the, is it, is it, will it benefit us in the end? In the, in the beginning, we said yes to practically everything because we just wanted to get ourselves out there. Um, so yeah, you know, just kind of like familiarize yourself with the tools that you need to get a job done. And if you don't know what those are, and again, nowadays it's so, accessible to information is so accessible to us that you know a, again a spreadsheet is so easy to come by to to create a budget to create a financial report um i mean i'm talking a lot of nuts and bolts here but mm -hmm. you know things things are not terribly hard to find out and then you know if if it's not a natural sort of thing for you to learn them can can occur um mm -hmm. and you know those first concerts those first um oh, and i should say this also that as time went on the group really trusted my guidance because they felt like i was i was very transparent very open about you know th these sets of gigs are going to uh, uh result in this in this fee and or this opportunity is here and it's great if we if we go after this for these reasons um and so yeah the group really did trust and 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 does um trust that me in that i'm going to make good decisions on behalf of the group so on this so one of the things i've always so you know monica and i've known each other since we were young we were in grad school together and have remained fast friends since and i've you know, watched Imani from its beginnings to all that it is now. One thing um, that um, I've admired about um, Monica personally is the way you've handled your money um, and the way you've handled money in this business. And as the managing or administrative, you know, partner within Imani, 
you're you you know you've spent a lot of time working on Amani's money, and I would just uh, you know yesterday in yesterday's session, Katie said something which I thought was uh, great, which she re she referenced someone saying something to her along the lines of, uh, "I thought you were a starving artist," and her right. responding like, "Who told you that?" <laughs> and I immediately flashed on you, and um, and you were you know thinking about. You know, you, you own property uh, in Harlem when I was, you know, we were just we were right out of grad school. And so if you could just talk a little bit about your attitude and approach to money, both sort of as a musician and a professional and sort of managing, you know, being a freelance independent artist. And so what type of structures have you put around yourself to feel secure in that field? And, you know, and also from the perspective of Imani as well, right? How do you set fees? How do you know? How do you how do you how do you know how much to ask for? Um, my mother in law, as it relates to this stuff, as a maxim, she says, if you're not embarrassed by how much you're asking, you're doing it wrong. Which <laughs> I don't know, uh, yeah. But I'm just so yeah. For yeah, let's let's hover around the money piece yeah. a little bit sure. and how that's sort of you know shown up for you. Yeah. Well. I, I happen to come from some really frugal beginnings, uh, you know. Um, so my parents were, were were pretty were pretty tight on the on the purse strings there, you know. So you coupon clipping and and uh, sale finding people. So I, I come from a long line of that to begin with. So, <laughs> you know, so there's that. Um, just this, that's a part of my DNA. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then I guess as I bring that to my own life, um, yeah, I, I do think about, say, I thought thought earlier on that probably some 20 something would think to, um, to um, invest, to save for the future, to look at, you know, and it's not about how much money you have. You don't have to have, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to be able to do some small investing to think about your future. And it wasn't that, I thought, oh, this is gonna, I need to do this because this this music thing ain't gonna last forever. I wasn't even, even thinking about that. The notion of, of just being a part of our greater system, our greater economic system was really interesting to me. And, um, you know, so I, yeah. So like I, I, I got wind of, of a friend who was talking to it and, uh, uh, financial advisor, you know, and, and so this kind of terminology is, again, is not what a lot of, um, late 20 something to think about, but I kind of did and, and looked at ways to put my money in different assets and different, um, different pockets of, of investment that, that would, yeah, that would make me some money. Um, so I, I brought, I brought that mindset, I think, to the group, not, not, you know, completely because we're dealing with other people's money and I don't want to speak for everybody, but I did have a, a pretty, um, pretty strong feeling about debt and having as least amount of it as possible. Credit card debt, um, you know, or having the right kind of debt. You talked about home ownership. That's, that's the kind of debt that's the good debt, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I didn't want us as if I'm starting out being a, 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 an administrative director or leader in the, in this group talking about finances, I want us to be, feel secure um, and, uh, but at the and, and and feel like we're going somewhere, um, but not at the, um, you know, not at the behest of losing money when it comes to like spending money on credit cards. Like that, that just never appealed to me. I'm like, no, mm -hmm. just no, no, no. We just we won't have. We'll go without before we will rack up a bunch of credit card bills. Um, so yeah, that's just my philosophy in general that I did carry over to the group and. Um, you know, even to this day, when we just talk about fees, I wish they were larger. I, we're still we're still wanting to work less for more, <laughs> frankly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's just, I think, what everybody should be thinking about. Um, I, I like the, what your what your mother in law said. You know, if you should feel a little skittish about asking for a certain amount because you deserve that. And so we uh, at, there came a point where we were probably about eight years ago or so. Um, maybe maybe longer than that, maybe nine or one or 10 years ago, we said, you know what, we are working our tails off, which was great. That's a good thing. We're out on this. We're out here. We're doing gigs. We're doing everything. But we got to think about self-care. Just we, families were beginning to emerge within in, uh, different 
people in the group um, and it's time to maybe not be out on the road as much and increase our fee. And that was a that was a, um, a collective decision that we made. And I kind of said, well, y'all just know that we might go through a period of downward turn because, you know, the money is on the road. But at the same time, yeah, we had to think that if it's if it's all about just getting money and not about being home and being able to do other projects or being able to just have that relief, then what is what's the point? So we went through a period of working less and increasing our fee and having a couple of years that were a little little lean, um, but then needing to stay the course and know that if you keep that level of asking fee, then eventually, you know, you can maintain it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, you know, we did that and, and have maintained it. Then there comes a time where you have to just, again, get back to the reassessing, get back to the re-examining of what you're doing, what you're worth. Um, we had to come to a realization of our, I talked about our outreach concerts a bit, that they were worth more than we were being paid, frankly. Mm. Uh, where, you know, people kind of, kind of sh push outreach, shoo it to the side a little bit and, you know, we're really know, uh, becoming known for doing these really great outreach performances and different types of interactive concerts. And, you know, we're, we're like that, that worth is just as much as the recital worth. Now, you can say that and it is, you'll never get the same fee, but we do need to get it a little, a little closer. So mm -hmm, that was mm -hmm. a realization for us that we needed to come to come to grips with. We have about 20 minutes left here, maybe a little less. And so I'm going to, let's start, we'll do some rapid fire stuff and then we'll, we'll check in on our questions from, from our, um, from our audience. Awesome. Um, so one quick question as it relates to fees, does Imani wins, is there some percentage of the fee that goes back to Imani itself? So is Imani, so you're, you know, everyone's getting their five checks. Is there a sixth check? It goes to Imani, and is that oh, just yeah. built into your fee structure? And how long has that uh, been in place? Yeah, yeah, it's been in place for a long time. Absolutely, there is. You have to, you have to feed the beast mm -hmm. <laughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we we have we have a few terms for it. the pot. You know, like mm -hmm. put some back in the pot like this mm -hmm. little coin jar mm -hmm. um and then we actually call it this goes artistically as well as a matter of fact as well as financially the sixth member of the group is imani wins there's mm. five of us but there's a there's absolutely a sixth member that is imani wins and it sits right in the middle of our little half circle um mm -hmm. we feed that financially so that we can pay bills like plane tickets and hotel costs and rental cars and uh managers fees but we also feed it artistically, realizing that your um, the sacrifice you have to give of yourself for that sixth member. That absolutely the individuals are important, and that's the beauty of chamber music. That you are the only person in that seat, and you know it's just the five of us all the time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but how is my how is my artistic decision feeding the, the better the, the 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 greater good? So um, so yeah yeah there's always money that has to be set aside um for those bills but even past the bills you know the projects that you want to do the ideas that you want to have nowadays um we're we're just a year into having a foundation we just started a nonprofit arm to our whole operation and so now we're looking at you know the importance of doing the things that we've always been doing but raising money for those in a in a in a capacity that we have you know more control over and we can really get donations and contributors to buy in to our vision of of what we want to do so mm -hmm. you know that's a whole other aspect that we we have a board we've got you know mm -hmm. we're we're reconfiguring our operations um amongst the foundation within the foundation so more change more more wow. growing i've got a question here from the chat um it says uh, time management and scheduling has been uh, a big issue with my previous woodwind quintet. I was wondering how did you and the members of Imani Winds manage this problem? Do you have any tips and suggestions? Yeah, I, and I'll try to I'll try to not go off on tangents. Um, <laughs> time <laughs> management, yes, it's it's um it's it's a tough one. It's a tough one for individuals. It's a tough one for groups because everybody's busy, right? Well, I think having not starting with the issue of time management is your first step. Start with the issue because that's already like 
two steps away from, you know, that's not addressing the problem, I think, or the issue. Goals, what are your goals? What, it, what do you actually wanna do? Having that overriding vision and purpose and mission, um, not to get too deep, you know, these are things, just conversations that you can have, especially with a younger group, uh, have that established so that then, okay, we got this. And this, by the way, we had to do even do tangent. I know real quick. Um, we do it. We did a retreat with a, mm. a, a life coach, essentially, um, mm. uh, some years ago, not many years ago. And we learned these different types of um, skills because these things mm. aren't natural. That's, you know, um, they help. He helped us to establish the boundaries, establish the roles, just so, you know, again, that's another conversation, but one thing I learned from that is having these overarching um, uh, mission statements and, and purposes will allow them for the time management to grow underneath, you know? So then uh, we've got this goal. And even if it's not that deep, we've got a goal of this performance at this date. We need to put in these amount of hours. Let's get to it, period, you know? So maybe that will help with it. And it it makes it a little bit easier just saying, hey, you free next Tuesday? You know, that's where time management gets a little more complicated. So think bigger. Okay, fantastic. Sorry for that. I got a little something in my throat. Um, So here's another question. Uh, Do you envision yourself as more than a musician? And and have you always? Um, Yes, is is the answer. And not necessarily. Um, is have I always? I don't think so. I think I think <laughs> I mean I've certainly, um, you know, more than a musician. I'm I'm a family member. I'm a mom. Yeah, I'm uh, you know, uh, I'm a community organizer. You know, I've got a lot of things now. But early on, I um, didn't necessarily envision myself as something bigger or, or more involved than a musician. And I was about to say than just a musician because being a musician is a whole lot. <laughs> That's a lot yep. to take on right then and there. So yep. I think early on, I felt like being a bassoonist was going to allow me to have a, a, an extremely fulfilling life and, and um, you know, exciting career. As time has gone on, and I've gotten older and experienced other things and been in this group for all of these years, um, I've realized that indeed I'm, I very much am more than, than you know, just a musician. And I love mm-hmm. it. Uh, okay, so this is a question that says, uh, in light of fewer and lower quality music programs in our public schools, what do you see as a solution to increasing access to music education for minority students? Whew, yeah, that's a big one too, right? Um, well, you know, it comes with other people in power, people in positions of power, and this is something that we're talking a lot about in these days of unrest and and you know racial awakenings, right? As as that 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 folks are talking about, pe- 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 people in positions of power have to recognize that these inequalities are there, that um, it's not just by accident or by chance that black and brown kids don't have the same opportunities that other white, that white children or other affluent communities do have. And that trickles down to, uh, to, to schools and to music programs. And so, you know, I would hope that those in power recognize that and, and allow, not even allow, that's not even the word to use, but, but see the benefit of having a more diverse platform when it comes to people that can actually su- subsidize, can pay for programs that can ha- that can help uh, minority kids. So you know, but that's basically that answer is wait for somebody with money, and that's you know that's a drag. We don't want to deal with that. <laughs> so then, so then what, right? Um, you know, it's people like you and me, Alex, that are out here trying to trying to make a difference. And I, oh, I think the the most that we can do is try to empower others that although we're not in power power positions we do have a platform um that can allow for programs to emerge for kids to have access to you know if i say something to somebody that is in power like that might flip the switch some um so you know it's also like search things out search opportunities out use your resources in your community to see where there might be opportunities for for you as a kid growing up and you know 
LA, whatever, wherever environment you're in, there's people out there that want to help, you know, and I think um, you're, you're just one or two steps away from finding where that help is. Uh, and and mm-hmm. it, it takes a little digging, but things can get done. Yeah. On that, and I also think part of it is, I think, you know, the, the musical tradition that you and I work in and we're trained in, you know, it requires a whole lot of resources just to get right. started. And so I think right. if we also start to think, well, like, what is music education, right? And does what is music education with that? Does it does it have to involve analog instruments? Can it involve digital stuff? Does it have to does it have to uh, hover around Western European sort of classical music and notation? Right? right. I mean, I think one thing to note is that part of the part of the challenge certainly there's there's huge uh, real funding inequities that show up across a range of things that happen in schools, not just music and art, right? Other other right. things as well. Um, but there's also, I think, the role that um, cultural affirmation plays in all this, and 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 so are 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 we um, are we is this what do we mean when we say music education? But this isn't yes. this this isn't this talk. So let me because I want yeah, to no, this, you're totally right yeah. though. It it comes in so many different formats and in so many different styles of music, and that's another mm-hmm. thing too. Recognizing that within our European-based classical institution, that you know that institution needs to recognize that there's other other ways to educate musically educate mm-hmm. children and mm-hmm. yeah yeah you know like you said it's a different conversation but um Definitely. yeah man find kids f- find your way yeah it's out there so let me talk about we'll end we i think we'll, we'll end on this um the role that mentors and champions have played in your life and um how how did they find you did you find them you know, um, and what what advice? So that's one thing, and that might end up where your advice is. But then the, the other question would be: Is you know, what's what's some general what what advice would you give your seventeen year year old self as she was heading off to Oberlin? So let's start with the role of mentors and champions, mm-hmm. and like, you know, yeah, how did you how how did you find them? Did they find you? Um, what's that all about? And then yeah, yeah what advice? Well, yeah. Um uh they did find me in a lot of ways um again i come back to just being so grateful and thankful to having parents and family members that put me in positions so that they could so that they could find those those um uh mentors um and and i would say me being open for that to occur you know me being recognizing to this very day and i think this this does lead to the to the success uh, artistically, financially, I have, I don't have any of the, all the answers at all. Like, you know, (laughs) there's way more people, smarter people than me out there, you know? So having that openness and frame of mind that, um, allows for you to receive the mentorship, I think is really important. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't, you're, you are not an Island. You are not, you're not out here. And, you know, again, being a black musician, you feel very isolated, right? It's, it's difficult for us to even um, uh, uh, have that notion that we're not out here by ourselves, but you really aren't. You know, there's people that want to help. There's organizations nowadays, and even back in the day, that 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 are there for your for your use. So yes, that mentorship is really important, and I think um, what in addition to mentorship, sponsorship <laughs> is just as important. You know, mm. the mentorship. What's the difference uh, between the two? Yeah, speak about money. Oh, uh, there you go. You know, yep. straight up, straight up. It's not just about it's not just about the giving of your time and your expertise, but it's about writing that, you know, stroke that check, bro. It's like let's let's talk about how to really put the mentorship in action um, by, you know, by, by by giving resources to those that cannot that do not have it or cannot provide it for themselves. Mm-hmm. So that's, what, that's, you know, that's that difference of sponsorship. And, and, you know, there's, again, all sorts of ways to unpack that. But um, yeah, yeah. So I did, I did have really, really amazing people that, um, that gave me that guidance uh, and, you know, kind of were looking out for me. And, and it just takes one, like, that's the other thing. The feeling of isolation is so prevalent in our community, you know, and I, and I get it, I'm not denying it at all, but it really just takes one adult, one, uh, 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 you know, that one, you, that one outreach as you as a student saying, Hey, 
teacher A, you know, can you just help me do X, Y, Z? Nine times out of 10, that will grow into something you can't even imagine, you know, cause that will, that, that will like, those those uh crumbs that you plant you know those seeds that you plant mm -hmm. will grow into all sorts of um fruit bounty mm -hmm. <laughs> um so yeah you know it just kind of takes a little bit of outreach on your part and next thing you know who knows where you are now you mm -hmm. asked another one. Oh, i did advice. yeah right. yeah what advice would you give 17 year old monster ellis right <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like you don't know everything because you're 17 years old and you're like, eh, you know, I can flip my collar a little bit. You, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, be, be, be knocked down a peg. We were joking at the beginning before we before we got on uh, got on the, the webinar that um, practice your arpeggios was my was my advice, right? And so, what do I mean by that? Like, just be excellent. Be excellent at what you want to do and what you are doing. So, you know. What do you mean, practice my prejudice? But there's so many more important things to do. Not really. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not really. Like you having your craft together to to the point where that cannot be taken away from you is so vital. Now, when I talk about Imani Wins rehearsed with that's like our rehearsal separate from the individual rehearse the practice we will rehearse for six hours in any given time frame so that we would just get a phrase just right a, an intonation just right um mm -hmm. a, a a musical idea in cohesive just right so yeah you know do do that work which like i said is not it's something that no one can take away from you and then you'll find that the other things begin to fall into place. Mm. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of multitasking. Don't don't get me wrong. You got to do that work and and do a whole lot of other things. But um, at the end of the day, your craft, your musicianship, your artistry is going to define you. And that's what you have to focus on, I think, so much, especially mm. in the early years. Fantastic. All right. Well, we are right on time at the top of the hour. I'm going to uh, invite our uh, L.A. Phil friends to sort of check in and sign us out of here. Um, maybe if, if I missed something in the chat, please bring it to our attention and we'll, we'll hang out and try to uh, attend to it right now. But let me just um, for myself personally, Monica, thank you so much. This is so much fun and I'm so grateful to call you my friend. Uh, you. I admire you so much as an artist and a professional. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, we'll, we, we should make a series of this, man. I can do this all, all right. day. But, but everyone else has got stuff to do, so we got to let right. them go. Um, so I'll turn it over to Angelica and Emily if there's any sort of housekeeping that needs to be done. And of course, thanks to the LA Phil and Yola National for creating this opportunity for me to connect with a good friend and a good friend to tell the world uh, some awesome stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica and Alex. That was brilliant um we got a lot of really great questions a lot of which we weren't able to get to so sorry about that if we didn't get you to your question um but one thing that did come in was if people want to get in touch with you is there a way to do that on social or where you at uh, Monica? sure yeah 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 well you know imaniwins.com for the group uh imaniwins uh, slash our facebook page our chamber music festival um which i didn't even get a chance to talk about that is in its it would have been in its 10th year imani wins chamber music festival held at manis here in new york city uh it's a pre-professional um chamber music event 11 day event that um is mostly for undergrad and graduate speak folks but um over 18 really folks in any part of their careers can apply. Um, so yeah, check that out. We actually have uh, a virtual version of the festival happening. So uh, August 10, 11, and 12, a three-day virtual thing, which is a new event for us, a new new platform. So we're, we're pulling that together. Um, and then yeah, Monica at ImaniWins.com is my personal email address. Um, some of those questions that we get didn't get to, if, if I can uh, answer, I'd be happy to do that. But um, uh, uh, yeah, and my own Facebook is, is there too to check some out. I've, I'll give myself a little plug. I had a New York Times um, blurb I today. That. I was a part of some artists that were asked to to talk about the state oh, yeah. of yeah, black classical music, black classical musicians, uh, musicians, black musicians in the classical world today. So that came out today um, amongst some you know incredible other artists. So check out the art section of the Times on uh, nice. on today. So. Yeah, it, 
it's it's it, there's ways to find me so i'm i'm again very grateful to be on this platform and thank you all for asking me to be a part of this thank Fantastic. you yeah and thank you angelica for putting that link in the chat if anybody wants to to click through right there thanks angelica. Awesome. awesome yeah well i think that's it angelica is that right anything That's else you need to share? I want to say thanks again and uh, we'll see you all again on Tuesday with Delaney and Katie uh, so we'll see you then thanks great thanks, thanks everybody Alex thank Bye. you all see you Monica thank Bye. you you're welcome